Good afternoon. This is Comp 422 and Comp 620 Information Privacy and Security here at AMT. Uh, today we're talking about, well, maybe we are, uh, social engineering. Uh, and we'll also be talking a little bit about spear phishing. Uh, okay, social engineering. Now, this is the College of Engineering. You should all know about engineering. So, social engineering is, is uh, attacking the most vulnerable part of the computer, the people. It's trying to manipulate, well, you can see my definition, I think I stole from Wikipedia, is trying to make people give you information because they think you're a trustworthy entity when you, in fact you are not. Uh, it's, it's a fraud. It's trying to convince somebody to do something that they should probably not be doing. The easiest way figure out the password to our place. Instead of using these password crackers or SQL injection, simply ask somebody who knows the password, ask, ask them to give you the password. And they might. Unfortunately, far too often, people give you information that they, in hindsight, should not be giving to you. Users often make bad decisions, particularly naive users. Uh, I'll pick on my wife again, but uh, yes, sometimes, you know, you can see my little example here, reformat the C drive. Oh, okay, click. No, bad mistake. Uh, people use it, we've talked about insecure passwords. Many people just don't know what they should do. And frequently when give them a pop-up message warning them, they click okay. Particularly if it's not clicking okay, will stop them from doing what they wanted to do, which may be a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, phishing is one fraudulent activity that we're going to spend most of our time on today. Phishing is going out and asking users for masquerading as a trustworthy entity, typically done by email, where you send an email message to somebody and you ask them information, posing as somebody that they should trust, making the email look like it's authentic. Like it's coming from a source that the individual is often a supervisor in the business situation or a commercial entity that bank or Amazon or somebody they think they should be responding to. There are different types of phishing. The people who make up these silly names go wild on this. There's more than this. But there's spear phishing, which is not just a general Regular phishing you might send out to everybody whose email account you can find. Every email address you know, send it out and hopefully you get it. It's very cost effective because if you send out a million emails, it probably doesn't cost you hardly anything. And all you have to have is one out of 100,000 people reply. You know, one hundredth of 1% of the people reply Bingo, you scored. It's 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 cost effective. Spear phishing makes it even more effective because spear phishing is sending out the email to particular people who may have the information that you want. For instance, it's sending it out to people in a particular company masquerading as their supervisor. If somebody got an email that was from Chancellor Martin, you go, oh, what does Martin want us to do? Click here. Yes, well, I should do what Chancellor Martin wants us to do. But of course, it's probably not him. Uh, that would be spear phishing. Whaling, which of course is like spear phishing, but it's directed towards the executives, people who have often more authorization than they should. Uh, people in charge, the CEOs, the other senior executives, because they often have the ability and the authorization to make big financial decisions. And then there's clone phishing. Clone phishing is a technical thing where you afford a legitimate email that has an attachment, but you've changed the attachment to something that's malicious so that when they open it up, it does something that they didn't want to do. As I mentioned, it's very effective. 95%, that's almost everybody, of all attacks in the enterprise networks are a result of spear phishing. You get all these ransomware attacks, all these other kind of attacks start typically from, spear, from phishing. Somebody has sent somebody in the company an email message 
and they don't you don't have to have a lot of people reply. Typically, only one person has to reply, and bingo, they've got what they want. Now, your IT organization may recognize the spear phishing very quickly and block it, go back and get it. But if they don't block it in the first couple of minutes, somebody might read it and react inappropriately. Note that, uh, well, we'll show some growth curves in just a minute, from 65% last year. Uh, and while 95% of the people, uh, or 95% of the attacks resulted from spear phishing, 76% of those, three quarters of them, reported being the victim of phishing attacks. Uh, and one and a half billion new, new phishing attacks every month. Uh, some of the monetary values, uh, the FBI, here's some old statistics in three year, or four years from 2013 to 2016, FBI investigated over 22,000 of these Saw losses of $1.6 billion. Uh, I got more on losses, but that's uh, social engineering sites, your Facebook and Twitter and those are ripe for spear phishing or phishing of any kind. Uh, they send these people messages on uh, Facebook or something, often posing as their friend, which is cap they're capable of doing, and sending out the messages so that people click on things. Usually it's a click here and you go to a website that causes damage. Yeah, here's one, uh, MySpace is a is a social media website uh, and it's uh, got an awful lot of people. And again, here are 70% successful on social media attacks. So that if you're uh, out to do something, social media, social engineering, phishing is the way to go. Uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, described first in 1987. That's, what is that? Uh, 35 years ago, so 35, that's a while working on it. Uh, big attack against AOL, uh, huge one back there. Uh, yes, and I realized the Warner Cry rest, that was about five years ago, uh, attacked people in 150 countries. Here's a chart of phishing reports. You can see it's just growing tremendously. This is a rather old, it ends in 2015. I have a newer chart that I got from a Zscaler blog. And you can see the growth is just huge. It's getting bigger and bigger. And this is uh, in the billions. Yes, this is one about 1.28 billion. This is, these are huge numbers. So lots of them out there. It's interesting though, who are they attacking? They're attacking you. Their education is the biggest area uh, that's getting attacked by phishing attacks. Now I suspect that it's probably not students. Well, a lot of it is to the students. You may be seeing a lot of uh, phishing attacks these days about job opportunities at the university. They're wondering about, uh, people are sending them all sorts of job opportunities. Click here to get an internship or something, but they're not real. And we'll talk about how to recognize it, but watch out for messages that come from off campus. The a and email system, I believe, at least from faculty, Gives me a big banner telling me this did not come from on campus. Do you see that for student email? Yes. External. Okay. So it tells you that. Yeah. So you can see uh, education. That's us. We're getting hit the hardest. Finance, of course. Why? So they asked famous banker, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Uh, and other places around here, you can, government, so forth. Technology only gets a small chunk, I suppose, because they may be more prepared to defend themselves. You can fish without a computer. You can use your cell phone. Phone phishing, which they've got a silly name for it too, um, which I can't pronounce, but you can do that with your phone. Uh, small text, using text messages instead of email. You can say, what, do you have a name for it? Smishing, yes, smishing. Uh, SMS, a small message system, that's your text, your phone texting system. Uh, yeah, so it's smishing. Uh, somebody had a lot of fun coming out with fishing and fish and whaling and you know, I don't care. 
Uh, yes. But this is where they send text messages directing you to a email. You usually get a text message and it has a link and it says click here and you click there, it goes to the website. Uh, my phone system warns me if I get a text message with a click with a link, it says, Do you really want to do this? Which is appropriate. Okay, here's a sort of clicker question, not really. We will not click on it, but yeah. Yes, you did. Or yes, you didn't, you didn't know it. No. Well, we'll not actually click on this, but stay tuned. There's more to click on, but yeah, there's not much answer here. Yes, if you have an email account, you have received, I'm almost positive you have received a phishing email. Let's look at some examples. So, you know, hey, the son of the late Nigerian banker or the Nigerian prince. It used to be the Nigerian prince was the big, big one a couple of years ago. Uh, that one, it, it's not very, not, nobody goes for the Nigerian prince. I still get them. I still get messages from Nigerian princes. Uh, and then the first national bank, uh, but it's not very real. Who, who is going to go for that one from the first national bank? Most of them look better. You can copy. In fact, if your bank ever sent you real email, they copy that, change it a little bit, and send it on. It's easy to go out and get the logos. And so you go out to the bank's web page, and you you right click, save the image, copy it, put it on your on your phishing email, and there they. There they have the, uh, the link, which probably doesn't go to where you want to go. Ah, uh, here's one I got just on my own. Uh, click here. Now, there's the Fox Exchange Server Mailbox Manager. Uh, before me, but I don't, Fox Exchange, who are they? I never had an account with them. Yes. Uh, and the account goes, click here, it goes to what? Visualforms.com. Many of them go to the uh, survey websites because they have a nice formatted survey that'll ask you for information, click submit, and it puts it into their database, just like you'd want a survey website to do. And then in a couple of days, they go out to the survey website, pick up the data and run. Yes, now, one thing important, I think we've talked about this before, is that if you have a email message or a web page that has a link, in this case, www.nice.com, when you click, click on it, does not mean it's going to go to nice.com because on an email link, there's what's shown and the URL that it will use when you click on this. They do not at all have to be the same. In other words, if you have what here, HTML, you go to evil.com, but will display nice.com. Now, if you mouse over this, you should, in the lower, lower left-hand corner of your browser, at least on a computer, laptop, or something, you'll see the link. My phone doesn't show me the link, so you're on your own on your phone. Uh, oh, websites can also be fake. Uh, you can do clickjack attacks. I hope you know about that. Many of you do. Uh, and fake digital, digital certificates. Uh, yes, you could have a fake site. It will have a fake digital, well, it has a real digital certificate that it purchased from a real uh, certificate authority, but it's not for the company that you think it is. A lot of people slightly change the name of a company. They print Amazon with A M A Z A N. A N. That's not how you spell Amazon. But you know, most people don't recognize that it, it works. Uh, frequently what happens is you have people who will redirect your traffic. In other words, if you click on a fake First National Bank, they will take your input and send it off to First National Bank. When First National Bank applies, it goes to the attacker and then back to you. It's very much like an HTTP proxy that we've used before. Although in this case, the attacker is saving all the information. They see your password and user ID as you go in. Uh, they see the information coming back from the website, how much money do you have. No use tacking a poor graduate student because they don't have any money. Uh, 
you might want to attack somebody who's got some cash. And of course, you can use cross-site scripting. We know about the dangers of cross-site scripting, or you can send JavaScript in a message. And the website can do things that you didn't expect it to do. Okay, what do we do about this? Because this, remember, purpose of this course is not to teach you how to be a good attacker, it's to teach you how to defend against these attacks. Sometimes it looks like I'm training attackers because we talk about, well, let's do an SQL injection and let's do a cross-site scripting attack. Yes, but purpose is not to, purpose is to understand how those attacks work so you can defend against them. Uh, okay, what do you do? Well, of course, education is the primary solution. The people have to know about the danger and know what they can do to defend themselves against the attack. There's a whole lot of them. Uh, there's some legislation out there, but not a lot. Um, the secure websites, HTTPS, is a little bit of help. It means you are actually going to that website if you type it in. But remember that fake websites with similar names can also get certificates and they'll get the uh, uh, padlock also. Um, also, uh, graphics. A lot of um, of these screening. A and T has quite a bit of email screening that goes through. When you get an email from off campus, it has been screened to make sure it's not, or at least they hope it's not malware. Uh, and they look at the text. It's much more difficult to look at the image. If they put text in the image, then it's much more difficult for the scanning system to see because it is possible to look at the image, try to do uh, image recognition on it, but that it takes more time. Also, it can be uh, difficult and mess up the text so it's hard, uh, hard to read in the image. Humans can capture it, but it's difficult for a text or image to text recognition system to do it. So you can see the uh, malware, but a, a security system has a hard time reading it. And again, Part of the problem is that people make bad decisions. They will click on things that are not probably secure. And even though in this case it says, computer killer from black hat dot inca, keep blocking or just unblock, let it go. Okay. How do you recognize phishing? There are some standard things to look at. Uh, a lot of phishing attacks come from other countries and often written by people for whom English was not their native language, and they use poor grammar. If you're getting an email message from a multi-million dollar company, they are gonna have technical writers who will know how to use good English. Of course, nowadays, even if you can't use good English, you can get ChatGPT to generate it for you, and it always uses good English. It doesn't always come up with the right answer, by the way, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it uses good English with a bad answer. Uh, where did it come from? If you get an email complaining about a and T E I T services or telling you you have to reconfirm your password for your a and T email, if it doesn't come from a and T, don't trust it. It's not. Look who sent it. Uh, yes, and again, check that site. Uh, if it's an a and T site, when you look, if you look at where the link is going, it should be going to an ANT website. Sometimes there's an intermediate website where things go to a place that checks for, uh, excuse me, it checks for invalid or malicious websites. Here at ANT, at least for my email, for the faculty, all email messages are scanned and all links are changed. So when you click on it, it first goes to a validation website. And then if the validation website thinks it's legitimate, sends you to the real site. Do you have that? Do you see that on student email? Anybody ever notice that? Well, okay. It might or may not. Uh, oh, and real emails know who you are. They don't go, dear user. If you're sending you an email, they know who you are. They know if you're 
talking about your bank, your bank knows all about you. They don't have to ask stupid things uh, or have vague things about them. They know who you are. Yeah, a big thing I get is uh, credit cards. This is your credit card company. No, if you were my credit card company, you'd say you're like Visa or you see your MasterCard. They would know who they, they know who they are to be very specific. Uh, so, okay. Uh, this is not really a clicker question. We'll take a look at this. Let's see what's wrong about this. You see anything? Oh, yeah, there are many things. What do you see? Good. Yeah, I saw that. I saw those very things. Yeah, this was something I did notice. Uh, yes, first of all, uh, it's coming from who? UBC. That's that. That's 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 a Canadian website. What the heck are they doing there? Uh, Yes, dear email user, if it was real, it would know who you are. Uh, this The grammar in this first sentence is not very good. From your webmail help desk, who? Uh, yes, and system minister, that's very vague. If it's real, it's gonna be specific as to who it comes from. Contact, please, you know, if you have for help, contact us. Uh, yes, as I was mentioning earlier, a and email is uh, checked. Uh, faculty use an exchange email server. The student email is managed by Google, the Gmail system. For, for those of us with gray beards who've been around at a for a long time, uh, we remember once upon a time, a and managed the student email itself. Oh, should I say mismanaged the student email itself? Anyway, it didn't work real well. Uh, well, it's a tough problem. You've got thousands and thousands of email addresses out there. Uh, and so they gave, they sold the job to, to Google. Google takes care of it now. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the safe, the, yes, the Microsoft safe links is what, everything goes to safe links. If safe links thinks it's legitimate, it sends it on. I have about, I think only once or twice, I've clicked on something and I get this big message from safe links saying this, is a potentially dangerous website. You know, cancel, blah, 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 go on, whatever you want to do. Uh, yes, usually at that point, whoa, danger, danger, back off. Uh, yes, and then uh, other things, some systems have augmented password logins. They will, in addition to your password, they'll ask you when you first create the web, uh, create the account, Something. What's the? What's your mother's maiden name? Where did you meet your spouse? And questions like that, uh, and see if you know. That's. Those are sort of okay, but it's not hard uh, to get people to tell you what that information was. I can't remember what movie I watched where they were talking to a wealthy person and asked him an assortment of friendly questions, which were in fact all the questions on his banking website, and they could get in. Um, some, uh, yes, uh, one site I use, when you type in your username, it then goes to a website and puts up a phrase that you have entered previously. If you don't see the good phrase, then it's not that website. So if you don't see the phrase I'm looking for, then I don't enter my password. So it's a little bit trying to verify to me that it is the correct website. And of course, Many sites look at your IP address. Uh, if you log in once, you can say, remember this computer. And it's cookies, folks. So we're using cookies again. And if you have the right cookies, it's going to let you, if you know the right cookies, it's going to put you through more hoops. And of course, two-factor authentication is key to keeping these things safe. Uh, there's been all sorts of legislation. You know, way back in, what is that? 
18 years ago or something, uh, put out anti-fishing. Uh, and of course, it didn't pass. Some people have lots, lots of money. Best government money can buy. Uh, there are some things you can do. Uh, there are uh, some trade commission restrictions against fishing, and they have arrested some people and fined them and found them guilty of doing things. There are more and more laws coming now against doing malicious activities in the computer. Uh, I like this Pogo cartoon. Uh, it seems to fit in so many computer occasions. All right, any questions about fishing? Then I'd like to talk a little bit about, whoop, all right, yep. Uh, let's take a look at the results from the uh, exam. And if you'll hang on for a minute, I will share our screen. Okay. Uh, folks out there in the, in the networks, can you see the exam two results? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. Great. Yes. All right. Well, here are the results. It went relatively well. Look at all those A's. More A's than almost everything else. It was the median score. Uh, I'll show it to you in a minute. The median score is on the edge of the A's and B's. So almost half the people got A's. So it was a good exam. Uh, or maybe it was just too easy. I, I have to decide that. But there were a lot of A's, you can see. And then there were a couple of scores that weren't A's, but yes, that's the issue. Uh, here is my grading scale, which is in the syllabus, and you've seen it before. Uh, note that graduate students in Comp 620 cannot get a C minus D plus or D. It drops from C to F. That is the university grading system. And I might point out, graduate students, one F is all it takes. You get an F in a course, it's extremely difficult to actually graduate because you have to have a 3.0 GPA. You have to get like A's and almost everything else in there to graduate. Oh, what? Well, okay, you had to do the arithmetic. Uh, you can do about about 10 classes, 30, 30 credits to graduate. Okay, so an F is a zero. And so you have to go, how many four, you know, what is nine times four is 36 divided by 10 is 3.6. Okay, that's not a bad grade. But you can see if you have anything less than a three, less than a B average, you're not going to make it. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, as before, the certificate students did not do quite as well as the other students. Uh, again, the graduate students did better than the undergraduates, which I kind of hope so. I mean, all the graduate students were undergraduates, passed, and moved on, hopefully, good ones. Uh, you can see the, here the median, 89. The certificate median is actually higher than the undergrads. So even though there was quite a distribution, uh, the little bars, this is a, what they call a whisker graph, little bars of now, it's the high and the low with some outliers, but you can see there were people who got a hundred on this thing. So yes, some people got exam, including some of the certificate students some graduate students, everybody got hundred. So pretty good scores. Undergraduates, the median, that's in the B range. There were two, versions of the last question. One, if you were a graduate or a student or a, if you're a master's student or an undergraduate, you did the click jacking question. If you were under the post-baccalaureate cybersecurity certificate system, you did the uh, cookie modification question, I think it was, whatever it was. So you had one through. Both those questions were 15 points. So Blackboard counted up and said there's 115 points. But we either gave you a zero for one and the score for the other, other way around. So you could not get more than 100 points. The maximum score is 100 points, even though Blackboard incorrectly thinks it's 115. So if you've got a score of 100, be happy. It doesn't mean you got 87% of it right. No, that means you got it all right. 
it is not a maximum of 115. Okay, we're not going to look and see how people did on the questions. Uh, the average score by is the percent of correct. So uh, if it's a 10 point question and you got 67, that means the average score is 6.75. And you can do the arithmetic for other ones. Uh, question number one Chat GPT gave a very nice answer. The grammar was all correct, but didn't get you a lot of points. They missed some of the key issues. Chat GPT is good for grammar, it is not real good for technical answers. Uh, we looked at this, you know, hey, well, no, we looked at the chat GPT answer and the Microsoft's version of you know, large language systems before we gave the test out. So we knew what the answers were. Uh, and we, I, I had rain in my TA who wanted to take off lots and lots of points if you gave the chat GPT answer. I said, well, it's not against the rules, it's just stupid. Uh, so yes, yeah, so people gave it, Copied and pasted from ChatGPT. I think you got a four out of ten, pretty miserable score, uh, because it was wrong. Well, it wasn't. Wrong. It, yeah, it was wrong. Okay, four points is pretty nice. Uh, boy, the advice to your mother, or I should have been more open. I should, advice to your parents or your spouse. Uh, that was good. In fact, if, had I collected all the advice, we'd have come up with a great list of advice to give to people to keep themselves safe because you all have lots of good ideas. Of course, many things are repeated multiple times, but the sum of it was just a lot of good advice. On rare, or rare occasions, a couple of people would just go, use strong passwords. That's all That's all you can tell your mother? You're gonna let your mother out with just use strong passwords? So I took pity on his mother and I gave him a, board, a lower reduced grade. Uh, okay, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, the second of question was that was the one with algorithm. Uh, oh, I hope I didn't offend anybody from uh, Arabic countries. It wasn't intended. Uh, algorithm, it just looked to me like it'd be algorithm. Uh, but the computer science freedom farm, she wanted to send information. Okay, one of the, one of the statements in the problem is she doesn't want anybody to know she's even sending anything. If you want to just keep it secret, encrypt it. But if you don't want to know that they're even sending anything, you're going to have to hide it, and that's steganography. The magic word is steganography. You get you most of the points. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, there was part person noted that you have to say it comes from her. Digital signature is really key there. Um, because this is a clandestine operation, the digital signature does not necessarily have to use a certificate authority signature. You could use a certificate that uh, algorithm made up and passed to his followers, or her followers. Okay. Any other questions about the exam? We had fun grading this. Turns out that Blackboard edits your HTML when you upload HTML. It, changes iframe to xxxx and we're wondering what is wrong with people where do they get all this xxxx uh, html tag which by the way doesn't work nothing was appearing on the screen when we ran it so yeah so i'm sure that blackboard thinks it's defending me against all sorts of things but they made it a lot so we had to download it well i always, i didn't run it until i looked at it because it wasn't sure what you guys were going to do to me uh but we're no fools. We looked at it first, and then we had to change all the XX axis to iframe, and then try it and see if it works. Uh, again, that was pretty good. That was the uh, oh no, that was question uh, question ten. The statistics of question ten are not real good because I gave zeros to a bunch of people who were not in the other were in the other group. So uh, here, midterm grades, everybody. Should have gotten an email, actually two emails. Okay, I, I made a mistake in the first one, but I fixed it. Uh, yeah, when I had, there's a lot of numbers here. Right? There's 80 some people in class, 10 some, you know, lots of data points. They have to merge together, line up because they don't. And I missed the line, one of them, and but I fixed it. So you, the second one should be accurate. If you don't think it's accurate, do let me know. Uh, 
So, okay, there you are. And again, a lot of people, there are a couple of people down here in the lower area. If you are down in the lower area, note that today is the last time. What is it? It's, it's oh, I'm sorry. It's 5.05. You're screwed. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's past five o'clock on the last day to drop. The registrar's office is closed. I, you might be able to do a web drop. I think you might be able to drop on the website. Uh, but yes, but today is it. It's it's today. If you don't, by the way, if you drop a class, it appears as a W on your on your transcript. Uh, you're only allowed to drop a maximum of sixteen credit hours. Most classes are three three credit hours, so that's five classes. So you can drop a maximum of five classes. After that, you cannot drop. Even if you're flunking terribly, you cannot drop it. So if you drop, remember you're using some of your five drops, uh, only use them when it's absolutely So also uh, some people have to drop classes due to circumstances beyond their control. Oh, one student in this class gave birth last week. I gave her a pass on the exam. She can do it later. She was busy. Uh, so, Yes, but if you have a legitimate reason, then go out there and, and explain it to the administration. Um, and they will often, but not always, often help you out in that. Um, but yes, if you're just dropping because, ah, I never really liked the whole doing I never understood what the places he was saying, and I got, and you get an F, um, there's no excuse for that. Okay, questions on the exam that I ask? Answer any individual questions about the questions? Okay. And again, you should be able to see the feedback. The TAs have been told multiple times that if they don't give you full points for a question, they must provide written feedback in the in Blackboard as to why, what you did wrong. That's so if you come across you know you lost points, it doesn't say why. Well, let me know and I will chastise my TAs. But I'm pretty sure from all every place I looked, they were doing that. And of course, if you don't understand why they did that, or you think they're mean and cruel, well, we raise them that way. But if you think they're unusually mean and cruel, let me know and we'll reevaluate your exam. Okay. Then moving on. Okay. Oops. Excuse me. We we'll have to get back and share our screen. Oh. Okay. Talk about design. Anybody not know who Steve Jobs was? He was the co-founder of Apple, uh, a significant force in the computing industry for many years. Pixar, that was his, Apple. I mean, oh, those are big companies. And he made them. He, excuse me? Pixar, yes. And a couple others. Okay, design. We're talking about design thing. Uh, almost everything I... Uh, have in today's lecture about design, I took from the textbook chapter 14. So read chapter 14, get better explanations of some of these things than I will give. The textbook has a whole bunch of principles. Boy, it's just one principle after another. I will mention some of them. You can read about all of them. Chapter 14 is not very long. It's probably 10, 10 12 pages or so. It won't hurt you to read it. Uh, but let's go over some of the more interesting ones. First of all, Design fits right into the College of Engineering. Design is a key concept of engineering, and it's a key concept of uh, software design is you know, key to building software. And many of the design principles in computer engineering, or excuse me, well, computer engineering, in, in software, software engineering, is the same as you have for building other widgets that a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer might build. It also is important on making sure that the software is high quality, that you have avoid 
problems in software. Many software security problems are the result of poor software engineering. People have written software, created software in a sloppy haphazard way. And had they done a better job at it, the security flaw would not be there. Okay, here's my Venn diagram. Today we're talking about uh, uh, basically the applications of uh, design as it fits to all engineering and computer security. There is an overlap. Okay, a bunch of principles. I've mentioned the principle of least privilege previously. That's the whole idea that when you give people authorization to do something, you only give them uh, privileges to do what they need to do to get their job done. Don't give them more privileges than they need. Uh, a lot of systems will say, oh, we have to be root to run this. Well, no, you don't have to be root. You need one small privilege. You don't need to be able to do everything. Don't give them everything so they can do one small thing. Uh, by the way, this not only applies to humans, it applies to programs and other things. Uh, if it needs to do something, don't give it all privileges. Give it only what it needs. Uh, and if it's going to be a temporary task, give it what it needs, and then remove that privilege later on. And again, this is a fundamental rule of security. You've got to make sure that if you want to restrict things, give it only as much authority as they need to get the job done. And also, if you are the employee who has limited security, it's good for you because if somebody if somebody robs the bank and you don't you don't know the combination of the vault, well, it probably wasn't you. Uh, so it helps you in a way. It's no, it couldn't have been you because you don't have that authority to do that. Uh, yes, the principle of least authority, which is very similar to the principle of least privilege, and you have to read the textbook carefully to understand the difference. Uh, but least privilege determines what you can do directly. Least authority refers what you can do directly or indirectly, what you can have another program do to something. I don't think that one's very important. Uh, and of course, when you're giving out privileges, it's very important to you know, give them only what they need. You have to read the textbook to find out what the difference is. So, which, yeah, uh, it's a little fuzzy. I I put it. I I, I almost deleted that slide. <laughs> Copy should have. Okay. Uh, but yes, the privilege, least principle of least privilege is very important. In order to do that, though, you have to have systems that you can give these privilege to. Okay, I think I've already said this. You have to be able to give fine grain privilege. Yes, some systems, it's either you have every privilege, you are root, you can do anything, or your regular user, you can't, have, you can't access. It's much more effective if systems have multiple layers of authority. Turns out your Intel chip was designed to have four layers of authority. Windows uses two of them. You either got it or you don't. Database systems allow you to give out authority, limited authority. SQL allows you to do all sorts of things for managing the system. Most students, when they take a database class, learn how to do a select statement, insert, delete, and those sort of things in the data, but they don't learn about all the SQL statements for system management. You can authorize users, you can tell them, say that this user is allowed to look at this table in this database on a read-only basis, and that's all. And that's very useful if that user, or if even if that user isn't human, if that's a program, that program is gonna go out and read that database, that you provide them with an account that only has read access to that one table they're supposed to have. And therefore, it minimizes your exposure. Uh, mistakes and attacks cannot get more information than that. They can't, if the account running program does not have right access to the data, then no matter what an attacker does, they're not gonna be able to change the data. They're gonna look at it. There's also the concept of a view in databases. A view means 
instead of giving them access to a table, you can generate kind of a virtual imaginary table that is certain parts of the table. You can say, well, they can only see the student name and the major and maybe I don't know, whatever else you want them to see. And not let them see everything else. You can create a view and say, this is a read-only view of this table. And therefore, that user can access it with that authority and see only the information that they're allowed to see, only, only change the information that they're allowed to change. So uh, SQL provides all that information. If you use it, you have to make use of the security systems that you have. There's also the concept of fail-safe. Fail-safe means uh, stopping, if a system has some sort of failure, you wanna stop in a way that keeps the system safe. Um, yes. Okay, let's move on to this question. Just to see if you suddenly fell asleep. I have got to have a poll for today. Where are the polls? Hiding. There they are. All right. It's a really simple question. It's appropriately located right next to the answer. All right, put your cards up there. We'll, uh, we've got a team answer. You should count that one twice. Weird. What about that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, oh, I see it. Okay, got it right. Okay. And the answer is D, none of the above. Uh, okay, actually, almost any of the above will work. Oh, uh, end poll here. Here we go. Yeah, uh, we got a lot of answers. That's because a lot of them will work. Typically, they printed their messages. Uh, an application, a production level program should not print error messages to the user. You might say something, oh, a problem has occurred. You put details into the log. You should have a log, which is a file. Most systems are logging systems. You log an error, tell exactly what you, what were you doing, all the information you had, throw it in the log. So later, when uh, somebody's going back trying to fix this thing, they can look in the log and see what really did happen. And just tell the user, whoop, sorry, it didn't quite work. Try again later, something. Uh, Quit silently and not reveal any sensitive information. But of course, you do not want to uh, reveal any sensitive information. Uh, most systems should not fail quietly and not tell people it's not working. That's inappropriate. Oh, I see so many student programs where you know, try catch box, they go try the whole program, catch nothing, go on. So if an error occurs, it just doesn't do it. Okay, no error messages go on. And the students go, well, I didn't print an error message. It must be working completely correct. No. Uh, and of course, erase erase all in-memory sensitive data before stopping. That's a good answer. You want to do that because uh, you don't want anybody to see what's in memory. If you have, in fact, during the execution of a program, if you have sensitive information such as passwords and stuff, you want to erase them in memory so they're not visible if somebody later looks in memory someplace. Uh, in the Java programming language, passwords are usually stored as arrays of character instead of strings, because strings are uh, persistent. They can't, you can't change a string. Uh, string values are always, uh, what's the word I want for strings that can't be changed? What? Immutable? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Hey, gray beard, sometimes you forget immutable. Uh, so you can't really erase it. You can set a, a string variable to another value, but you can't change that string. Well, character arrays, you can. Character arrays, you can go out and change those bytes. So they store uh, passwords as character arrays, so you can go out and erase them. Uh, atomic actions are actions that can, oh, we have questions here.
Uh, oh, well, yes, I'm sorry. What was the answer to that clicker question? Well, uh, it was kind of a trick question. Uh, excuse me. Uh, all of them were right. It was, yes, if you clicked on anything, you were correct. Uh, prison error message, if you're in a debugging phase, well, yes, that's probably what you want to do. You want to print as much error as you can. Quit silently, well, uh, not always a good idea, although you might. Just tell the user that didn't work. Try again later. And definitely erase all sentiment before stopping. Okay. So it was a trick. I, those are some of the things you could do. And it all depends on the situation. Again, is it a production level system? Production level systems don't give details to the user. You do always want to erase in memory sensitive data before you stop. Always. Even when the program doesn't get affected. Should always erase the information in memory that's sensitive. Okay. Uh, atomic actions. Atomic action is something that either completes, complete, runs completely, or uh, doesn't run at all. There's no halfway. You cannot see any halfway action. It's common in database systems where you can do an action. You can say, insert this record. If the record is inserted, then it's there. Uh, if it's not inserted, then it's not there. You don't get half done. Also, it occurs a lot in multi-processor, multi-threading programs. Can this be see, can see this halfway? No. Uh, in database systems, they have the concept of a rollback. You start a transaction. You go, a, there's a transaction start command. You do a bunch of database updates. You search, you update. You, and then if everything looks like it worked, you commit. Commit is the keyword. Is, write this all out, and if it doesn't look good, you're saying, oh, that didn't work, you do a rollback, which puts everything back to the way it was before you started, as if nothing had happened. That's a useful concept. It's very big in databases. It could be used in other places, too. OK, fault tolerance. Uh, some systems are big on fault tolerance. There are a lot of systems out there that have to be fault tolerant. Uh, fault tolerant means if something breaks, particularly a piece of hardware breaks, the computer doesn't just stop, it just keeps on going. Sometimes it will keep going in a reduced functionality, but other times it just keeps on running. And you need them not only in hardware, software, and in management and processes. If something goes wrong, what are you going to do about it? There are used a lot in mission critical, life, life critical things. You can bet that nuclear reactors have software that runs them that is fault tolerant. Uh, a lot of systems have fault tolerant systems because sometimes it's extremely expensive to break. Uh, yeah, even your automobile, you know, airplanes, automobiles, healthcare systems, you want those things to work. If something breaks, if your disk drive decides, up, oh, it's time to die, you don't want the whole system to stop. I mean, if you're in an airplane and you get a blue screen, you don't want the airplane to stop flying. No, nope. you want to keep going while the pilot is trying to reboot. Uh, here's an example. I went out and looked at Amazon, which makes $470 billion a year. Uh, yes, I do remember um, Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos, who's the owner and well, major stock owner and creator of the Amazon system, uh, got divorced a couple of years ago, and his ex-wife was given a bunch of stock in Amazon. And she gave it away to many people, including a and She gave a significant donation to North Carolina a and State University, and to many, I think she gave money to lots of HBCUs. She spread it all around. She spent a lot of time just throwing billions around. And after doing that for a couple of years, she was wealthier than when she started because stock she had left just kept growing. So it's, life is tough when you just can't give it away fast enough. Uh, so anyway, yes, lots of, but that's not what I wanted to say. I just take that as an editorial comment. Uh, but they make a lot of money. So you do the calculations at something like $900,000 a minute. If their system crashes, and you can't go to Amazon and spend your money. 
they are losing 900,000, almost a million dollars a minute, and probably much more than that, because if you can't go, if it doesn't work, you might go look someplace else. So it's extremely important for them that the system keeps running. And they, of course, do have fault tolerance systems. They have servers all over the country, multiple servers making this thing work. It's an amazing system. And so, you know, if you if one place just falls apart, you know, a hurricane or lightning strikes some place and it explodes into flames, not to worry, they've got other places. This is why they have Amazon Web Services, where they sell extra web uh, computing services for cloud services. They're a big cloud provider because they have huge cloud systems that run their computer. And since they had to have huge uh, website, well, they decided to sell some of it. Make, they make a lot of money out of that too. Uh, an interesting example of fault tolerance systems is NASA's long life, no maintenance uh, project. And it's in the Voyager probes. Uh, those of you who probably don't remember when Voyager was launched in 1977, uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, actually. Voyager 2 was launched first and then Voyager 1. Don't ask me why. Uh, but that was how it works. And they are they went out to explore Jupiter and Saturn, which they did, and they were still running. So uh, one of them, I think it was Voyager 2, went out and looked at Neptune and Uranus. Uh, and then they just kept on going probably because there's not very good breaks in these things. And they just kept, they're now way out there. One of them's 15 billion miles away. And it's left the Earth's, or excuse me, the sun's solar impact. And at, at that point, by the way, uh, no use having uh, solar panels. The sun is just a kind of bright star out there. You're a long way out. Uh, yes, and so they've escaped the solar system influence in there now traveling through interstellar space. Uh, their power, unfortunately, is expected to run out in about 10 years or so. They have a nuclear power plant. Sad because they, uh, in a couple hundred thousand years, they'll be passing another planet or another uh, couple hundred million years, they'll be passing other stars. They could, you know, uh, okay, I have a silly question for you. This has nothing to do with computer security. But for several years, I taught the networking class. Okay, let's just let's get your cards out, get your clickers out. Let's do this. Uh, where is the pull button? Hides. Right. Excuse me. Okay, there it is. Okay, cards up. Good question. What? Oh, the people. Here we go. Oh. Aha. Just wait. Look up the phone. There we go. Okay. All right, got it. And all right. Hey, somebody must have paid attention when they took the uh, networking class. Yes, uh, hundreds, great big 160 bits per second. Whoa, that's really, really slow. Why is that really slow? Well, Claude Shannon uh, came up with this rule. Oh, I had lunch with Dr. Yu and her husband today, her husband worked at at and and worked with Claude Shannon. So you see, somebody knows somebody, how many degrees of connection. Anyway, yes, Claude Shannon came out with this rule about the maximum data rate based on the signal to noise ratio. And I'll tell you, the signal from a spacecraft 15 billion miles away is not real strong. There's a lot of noise out there. And so the signal to noise ratio is absolutely miserable. So the maximum data rate is gonna be really, really slow. So, yes, 160 bits per second. Which, by the way, you ever see these search for extraterrestrial intelligence things? And you go, how are they going to send a signal from many light years away with enough strength that we can tell? Mm, might not work. Uh, okay, more on fault tones. You can skip those, Scott. I get that. It had nothing to do with computer security. I just 
couldn't resist. Okay, uh, for fault tolerant systems, there are many of them use RAID disk. RAID is redundant array of independent disks. Uh, some of us are old enough, great beers, to remember when the acronym stood for redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. But they take multiple disks, put it together so it looks just like one mass storage unit, at least to the user. You can have a RAID controller where the hardware has multiple disk drives and to the operating system and the user, it looks like one great big disk. Or you can have the operating system do it. You plug a couple of disks in there, tell the operating system when you configure it that use RAID and it stores redundant information on the disk. So if one of the disks fails, you can keep on going. Uh, no, no data will be lost. Uh, there are multiple ways to do this. There's RAID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, RAID 2, 3, 4, almost never used. RAID 1 and 5 are very popular. Oh, there's RAID 0 too, but that doesn't provide any reliability. Uh, RAID 1 is very simple. It's mirrored, it means you have two disk drives. Everything you write on one disk drive, you put the exact same information on the second disk drive. So you write it both places. Uh, and when you want to read it, you only have to read off one of them because it's both the same. The advantage here is if one of them breaks, if all of a sudden that disk drive goes, you know, pieces fly apart, uh, you can just keep on going because you have all the other information in the other disk drive. And so it does require twice as many disk drives. So that's an expense, but you can do this. Microsoft Windows, particularly Microsoft Windows Server uh, supports this well and allows you to do it. If all the information doesn't fit on one drive, use RAID 5. RAID 5 does a clever exclusive or parity check across the blocks. And it, you have like, here we have four disks of data and then it puts a parity check, which is the exclusive or. If any one of the disks, we have five disks, if any one of them, or you can do it three, four, five, or six, seven, however many you want, you have to have one more disk than what it takes to hold the data. With any of the disks break, you can recover all the data because it, if you just exclusive or all the remaining blocks, you get the data that was lost. So you just keep on going, even if a disk breaks. Usually these things, if you have them, uh, particularly if you have a hardware controller, if one of them breaks, all of a sudden alarms go off, lights are blinking, and it tells you that this drive is broken. Yeah, the technician runs over, pulls out that drive, puts a new one in, and the system immediately starts copying the data that it's supposed to have back onto that drive. In an hour or so, you're back up as if nothing had happened. There's a concept of fail safe and fail secure. Uh, and they're slightly different. Failing, I, I like the, uh, the example here of doors. You have a door fail safe, door doors are unlocked when the power is removed so people can get in and out. So you aren't locked in the room. A fail secure, you take out the power, the doors are locked so you can't get in. So somebody can't sneak in by just cutting the power lines and walking in with unlocked doors. Upstairs, uh, uh, over in between uh, Graham Hall and McNair Hall, there's a set of big metal doors. They have a lock on them. That lock, if power drops, you can go through. If, was, it requires power to lock the door. If you lose power, good. that of course is because it's safety. If you lose power, there's a fire. Uh, the fire eats through the power lines, the power drops. You want to be able to get out of there. Uh, principle, again, all sorts of principles here. Principles, the economy of mech, the keep it, you know, the kiss, what is it? Keep it simple, keep it simple, stupid, or however it's supposed to be. But keep it simple, yes. Simplicity is very wrong. Uh, I instead of saying about how these quotes, I picked up a bunch of quotes and simplicity. You can just read these. I particularly like the first one by Dykstra. He has a sharp tongue. Yes. Simple, no problems are obvious, or complex, so complex where there are no problems are obvious. Uh, and then Steve Jobs, who, who simplified David Thoreau's uh, simplified, simplified, simplified. For those of you who 
didn't quite get through high school English. David Throw wrote Walden Pond and was a naturalist way back in the early 1800s. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to skip this question. Okay. Complete mediation. Every axis check. Make sure that it's allowed to do it. Uh, we talked earlier about the difference between time to check and time to access data. Sometimes you usually you check access in the beginning. You log in. What can this person do? When you open a file, are you allowed to access this? And then after the size, yeah, then you can just read and write it as you're supposed to. Uh, but sometimes it's necessary to check that access as you do the operations. Uh, then website access. It's noted that some sites you have to log in every time, although your browser will often nicely save the passwords for you and your username and password, you should never ever do on a public uh, system. Now, if it's your laptop or your computer where you maintain control over it, uh, if I have a desktop system at home, it does require me to enter a password whenever I get near it. Um, so I then feel confident and I want to go out to Blackboard. It tells me, it puts my username and password, I just have to press login and it works. You wouldn't want to do that if you don't have that full control of your computer system. Principle of open design. We talked about this for encryption systems, that it isn't the design that should keep it uh, secure. You don't want to use security. To secure. In other words, if, if the attacker knows completely how the system works, that should not grant them access. They have to know the key. You have to know that secret information that you don't tell them in order to get in. And remember that your source code may well not be secret. Uh, there's dumpster diving to get it. Uh, a lot of systems can be reverse engineered. Somebody gets the uh, the executable.exe file or a Java a class files, particularly Java class files. Java class files, you can. There are lots of interesting systems that take that class file and produce Java source code for you. Nicely indented. And if you use the debugging features on, puts all the proper variable names in, doesn't put the comments back in, but that's about the only thing you lose. And it's very, um, so yes, people can go out. Of course, companies generally work very hard to keep their proprietary source code secret because they don't want other people to see it. Uh, part of that is that you want to minimize the number of secrets. Don't think that everything has to be secret because some secrets will get out. Make sure that there are a few secrets. Keep them secure. Separation of privileges. Sometimes, yeah, mostly what they, I'm not sure why they call it separation. Of privileges. But sometimes you need multiple people to authorize an activity. If you're going to spend a lot of money, usually most businesses require a couple of people to authorize that spending. Um, uh, yes, there are sometimes uh, computer systems where you have to enter your user ID and the password of that system, and maybe your supervisor has to enter the user ID and password in order to do something particularly vulnerable. Uh, these common mechanism. Uh, this one, this one, I'm not real sure about. This is in the textbook. It says avoid sharing components. Well, sharing components is key to good software engineering. You don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time. You want to use what's out there. Now, later on, we'll talk about some of the problems of using uh, open source or available software or any software that you didn't create your own. Of course, there's great advantages to using software that you didn't create your own. Yes, you should always use available software. But if a flaw is discovered in that software, it will impact your system. Uh, sandboxes, sandboxes and virtual machines are ways of restricting what the user can do. You can run your program in a sandbox. If it runs in a sandbox, it means it's limited to what it can do. There's many systems that can't access files or something. For a long time, uh, Java would run Java applets in a web page. And the idea was they're supposed to restrict what it could do, what it could access. That's fallen apart because it wasn't as restrictive as people would like. But people often run things in virtual machines, trying to keep them secure. 
I, I also like principal least surprise. The software should do what you expect it to do. It shouldn't be, oh, who thought that would ever happen? Uh, yes, high complexity from the users, should be easy to install, easy to use. Uh, this is part of software generation, human factors. Uh, yes. Also, uh, one of the rules in life is surprise people act poorly. That it's a good rule for many occasions. Uh, remember that. But yes, uh, even with software, surprise people act poorly. If they're surprised, they may not do what you want them. Okay. What do we say today? And we'll be talking more about software. Uh, engineering and software design uh, on Wednesday. But the principle of secure design, the secure design, which is good for good quality software, also protects you for secure software. Uh, make sure that you understand all the mechanisms and environment which you're going to use. Look at it carefully, implement it carefully. It has to be carefully designed, it has to be carefully implemented. That's it for today. Any questions? All right, uh, follow the uh, syllabus and see what the reading material is out there. And if you have questions about the second exam, do send me an email and we'll look at it. That's it for today.